Hello there. Welcome to Intangible Notions on Top of Object, a performance exhibit curated by Michael DeBicro and Catherine Learson. Today we will be exploring objects accumulated during our busy, busy urban lives. Many may see these objects as trash. Today we will be exploring all of the ways in which they are treasure. Let's take a look, shall we? This first piece that we're going to be looking at today is entitled Urinal Sign, 2017. As we can see from the title card, this was originally an eight and a half inch piece of printer paper. Uh, 20 pound, 92 bright. And as you can tell, it's a mixed ink composition. We have gel uh, up in the corner as well as laser jet and then additionally ballpoint ink. Uh, for a little bit of context, uh, this piece was originally found in the men's restroom of an office building. So let's take this in. <clears throat> the first initial impression is the main message. We see three lines of text, each line being shorter than the line previous, with the last line containing solely the word urinal. The full text reads as follows. Do not put paper towels in the urinal. Uh, while this seems to be the original intent of the message, what we see in the upper left-hand corner is three commentators, or possibly one to two ambidextrous users, adding additional commentary. Uh, the first comment, stand, is written in a black ink, and it's a command mirroring the command printed. Note additionally that stand is written in a girlish script which might be alarming to some of the purveyors of the urinal. Uh, the second comment, sit, is written in a tighter script, uh, but in all capital letters and red ink. It is, in a way, a playful turn on the first, poking logic at the initial comment. Then we see the third commentator, apparently overwhelmed with choices, but armed with a blue ballpoint pen, Posits, hover, line break, jump. Now, at first, the notion of hovering is a positive one. It seems playful, uh, evoking, evoking notions of uh, surrealism and magic. Uh, the fantastical nature of hovering as, say, a witch is wont to do. But that being the case, the message actually takes quite a dark turn as the writer is asking the witness to do both the impossible and additionally the demonic for who but a witch can truly hover. Then we see a return to reality with an actually actionable action. Uh, we see Joan with excess question marks. Now, though, even though that may make us feel more comfortable than the demonic hover, we are still not out of the woods yet, because the witness does not know where the destination of the jump lies. Jump to safety, or jump off of a cliff. Additionally, notice the fingernail pressure applied to the grouted tile edge that lies beyond the substrate. How it mars the purity of the paper. Perhaps the commentators themselves left these fingernail etchings further proselytizing their anxieties, an impression of the cold wall from which the sign originally hung. The horizontal and vertical lines linger as a ghostly reminder of the construct of human society, both living on the grid and being confined by it. If you'll follow us right this way, Here we have Blue Bag, 2013. This is by far the most restored piece that we have here in the collection. It was found in an old apartment pressed between two pieces of cardboard. It's quite a miracle that it survived such an arduous flattening. Now, the restoration process 
has been quite extensive. Uh, using an iron on low heat, um, many of the wrinkles have been smoothed out. How you see the bag now is quite similar to how passersby would have seen it in 2013. The bag itself has generated quite a lot of controversy because of the restoration process. Many people on the board of trustees are conflicted. How far is too far? When will the bag lose its integrity? On the one hand, restoring it to its original form can be seen as a noble pursuit. But on the other hand, don't the wrinkles simply make it it? The bag itself is noble. It projects a certain amount of self-worth. But at the same time, it's quite vulnerable in that it is inanimate. What makes us feel tenderness? These are the kinds of questions Blue Bag evokes in the viewer. And Catherine, if I may point out one thing, I have never seen a bag like this in America. Have you? No, you wouldn't. No. Uh, there, I mean, there's just so much going on. There's no text, but so much color. Uh, it definitely gives off a, a continental vibe, uh, as if being from a different continent. You know, I would say this bag is definitely from Europe. Oh, definitely. Hmm. We're going to move straight this way. Now, this next piece is, in fact, a duo piece. Uh, it is two art objects juxtaposed right up against each other. Uh, so for this piece, what we're going to be doing is, at first, not perceiving it traditionally through our eyes. In fact, with the absence of. I will be donning a blindfold to experience the aromatic identity of the piece first, before we discover the uh, structuralness of the object. All right. Here we are. Hmm. Before the piece begins, let us take a moment to recognize what it is like, the vulnerability of standing blindfolded in a room and sort of the quiet courage that we are demonstrating right now. Hmm. Object number one. Youth. Lusty. Indian summer. Tobacco. Vitality. Does it smell of addiction or subtraction? Strength, stability, but above all strength. A, a sweet, but, but musky quality. Can you smell? Imagine the forbidden back of a truck, uh, an old throw crimped with the imprint of bodies. Mm. Yet, even so, there is an innocent quality uh, that departs. It is perhaps a bergamot? Is this the same bergamot of a prepubescent locker room teeming with life? Or is it the smell that erupts from death? Mm. Yet, even so, there is a cinnamon, a cherry tone. Uh, is it, is it cedar? Maybe it's pine. A tree. Ah, a tree, yes. Now let's veer to object number two. You'll notice immediately the floral quality, the way that it masquerades in nature. It, uh, it reminds me of a tea bag that I once read that said, flowers are God laughing. It's true. <laughs> Yet even so, notice the elderly identity here, the drape factor, as I like to call it, the 
crochet-ness about it. It's what I imagine a British queen might smell in a British garden in the golden hour of her life. Yet, despite the, uh, despite the elderly quality that does not elicit our carnal desires, it is still a dignified scent. I'm now going to remove my blindfold so that we may consider these two art objects together and see how perhaps the structure is at odds with the aromatic identity. Mm. Yes. First, we take in the candle, which looks as if it is being squeezed by an outer heat. But really, it is an inner fire that creates this form, rejecting the original armature that it was given at its creation. Now, I know what you're thinking. Contours. Yes. I'm mm. thinking it too. This object has a soft, supple, sensuous, tone to the curvature of its contours. Mm. Counter to the masculine hardness that the scent evokes, this candle projects and straddles both the masculine and feminine gender binary. Mm. In that way, it is a rebellious form, uh, masculine in one way and feminine in another. Moving to the tall apparatus of the lotion bottle, it's strong and bold, bold and green, elongated and dark, dark and green, green and bold, elongated and green. But on the inside, the inside, a creamy avocado moisturizer. Have you ever cut yourself cleaving the heart out of an avocado? I know I have. This lotion bottle was found uh, in a vanity. The original owner wanted to save it for all time, loving it so much in its first procurement, the youthful, peppy smell of the interior. Mm. But of course, time is no one's friend. Over time, the smell has faded into what Michael so aptly described and invoking in our own minds the idea of kitten heels and mm. crocheting. They say, save the best for last. But this piece teaches us to save the best for first. Otherwise, you will be living your life in regret, perpetually. We must use things when they are in their prime so that we may also explore our own primal spirits. They do make such a lovely couple. Mm -hmm. Love truly knows no bounds. That's a nice ending point for this. I think we should move on. Let's move down the gallery, shall we? Here we have Broken Shelf, 2009. This is by far the most handmade by man piece here in the gallery. Mm. It is a walnut panel, which it was originally four panels. They were glued together, clamped overnight, sent through an industrial sander, hit with a rotary sander, and then hit again and again and again with 200 grit sand uh, wrapped around a wood block. The edges have a simple range edge with a simple blade. Over time, the dark sable hues have faded to create a more uniform chestnut throughout the panel. Not marks are present suggesting its use as a cutting board, though the soft nature of the wood would make for a poor use to strike a knife again and again on. There was a desire by the owner of this panel to have it serve some sort of utility. That desire is futile. It took so much time to will these four pieces into one singular body. Wouldn't that have been enough? to just have it exist as a panel without forcing our needs and wants on top of it. Let's move now into the Tom B. Foundation Wing. 
Welcome to the Tom B. Foundation Gallery Wing. Uh, the next piece we're going to be looking at is Sketchbook, 1997. Now, this piece is very interesting because it is a rescued object. It was acquired, uh, bought, at a Goodwill in the Hudson Valley in New York uh, in 2015. It is a travel diary uh, that recounts several lackluster trips. Uh, what's so interesting about this piece is the way that the artist is truly present on the page. We're going to be reading an excerpt from a particularly sad trip to uh, St. Martin, which is an island that was formerly colonized by the French. Hmm. January 23rd, 1997. Rain upon awakening, 8.30 to 9. Clouds with wind, occasional intense sky, and sun throughout day. Two to three sprinkles, and then good through rain at 5 p.m. Trip slash snorkel slash sail to Prickly Pear Marine Preserve canceled due to wind and rough water. Postponed until Friday on same catamaran with 14 others. Breakfast at Veranda Restaurant just across from number 813, adjacent to Domain Pool. Quote, no, we do not serve outside, end quote. Later noted, family eating lunch outside at same location. Usual coffee with milk, no skim or low fat available, two times croissants with packets of butter, which had to be requested. Then no jam marmalade noted, then requested. Same young, hardly trained French waiter, grudgingly delivered by hand, in hand, one sole cherry jam in one small, single serving glass container, placed on a distant corner of my round table, and proceeded to charge me two dollars, ten francs, for the pleasure of the jam. When paying the bill, actually signing, I inquired as to why there was no cha charge the previous morning, when butter and a choice of jam and marmalade, uh, cerises et orange, were delivered to my table with my two times croissants simultaneously. The two waiters, to arrive to answer my question with studious concern, replied gleefully in chorus, it must have been your lucky day. I figured that I was not the first to ask this question. I scribbled my signature but felt like forging someone else's. Quote, have a nice day, end quote. I think that piece speaks for itself. Moving this way. Here we have Metro tickets, June 2016 through March 2017. Mm. There is a lot to unpack here. Note the medium of time on the information card. Each one of these tickets cost $114 during its monthly term. $114, now, that is more than the highest amount of U.S. currency. Then after 30 days, its worth value drops to zero. Not only is each ticket stamped with the mark of time because of its month, but also because of the commuting nature of these tickets, the time it takes to get to work, the hours worked, the hours worked to accrue the money to obtain such a passport. Passport. Mm. That is truly what these are. A passport between the oppressive Kenyan-esque nature of the downtown region, mm. bringing you to the quieter, less oppressive, tree-lined streets to the north, and so, how do we connect these two realities? Where does our mind go when we are living in such a limbo daily? Here, uh, we will be reading a manifesto by the artist uh, so that we may experience as a group that limbo together. This piece is about money. 
This piece is about commuting. This piece is about placing blame. This piece is about status. This piece is about personal space. This piece is about crying in public. This piece is about time. This piece is about lost opportunity. This piece is about seizing opportunity. This piece is about eye contact. Pause for eye contact. This piece is about economic mobility. This piece is about Wes Anderson. This piece is about restraint. This piece is about propulsion. This piece is about the fantasy. This piece is about kindness. This piece is about containing a nervous breakdown. This piece is about a meat cute. This piece is about losing love. This piece is about hope. This piece is about failure. This piece is about trusting again. This piece is about love. This piece is about loving yourself. Pause for eye contact. This piece is about loving yourself but hating your body. This piece is about hating your body but loving the space behind your knees. This piece is about loving your homo sapien thumbs. This piece is about loving your sense of smell. This piece is about knowing you will die. This piece is about dying sooner than you think. Pause for eye contact. This piece is about being left behind. This piece is about sharing what's left. This piece is about making something. This piece was already made. This piece is waiting here for you all day. This piece is in your way right now. Moving on. Hmm. We're now going to be moving into the key to etc. foundation experimental wing, where we're going to be taking a look at box series 2007. Now, this piece is by far the most uh, political piece that you're going to be seeing today in the gallery. Uh, it's also the closest to performance art that we'll be seeing today. In order to execute the piece, one merely needs to follow the instructions printed on the card inside of the brown envelope. I will read the instructions out loud. Step one, take each box out of the box it is in. Step two, place the boxes side by side. Three, read a loud note in small yellow box. Executing the piece today is going to be Catherine. Uh, Catherine, whenever you are ready. smoked cigarette, 2017. This is by far the gallery's most recent acquisition. It was discovered on the corner of Sedgwick and North Avenue. Uh, what is so interesting about this piece is that at first it seems to be a work in progress, unfinished. As you can see from the jagged burnt barrel tip, the artist seemingly had an initial intent of blackening the entire barrel up to the three gold pert lines. The lines acting as a sort of finish line, 
uh, with the Marlboro banner uh, signifying such an accomplishment. Unfortunately, the lines are not crossed because there just is no time. What's also interesting about this piece is the number of reproductions you are likely to find. In short, walk any city block and you are likely to find numerous reproductions and copycats strewn about street corners. But it's important to know what differentiates a, an original from a fake. You see, in the fakes, in the reproductions, you'll often notice a dramatically shorter barrel, uh, a more predatory consumption, and you'll often note that the barrel is chomped or crushed. In the makings of fakes, forgerists often feel compelled to overcompensate in an effort to make more realistic. But that's what's so beautiful about this piece. It's simplicity. It's clearly a commentary on multitasking, about biting off more than one can chew, but it does so in a hopeful way. It seems to say, I can only do so much as I can, and for this, I can't. It itself is a tiny revolution, saying, no, I will not burn the candle at both ends. Hmm. How powerful is it to say no in today's society when even self-care is seen as an act of defiance? Uh, it should be noted that at the end of the exhibition, uh, this piece will be returned to where it was found. Let's move over into the Boondoggle Memorial Wing, shall we? A Lean Key Series 2016-2017. Let's just uh, go around the horn here and examine some of the text. It's not a room, it's a residence. Funds do not expire, but fees apply. Welcome back, a Lean member. A soap opera, yet no drama. This piece, this series, is truly about the price of being elite. It is to make one feel important, wanted. It promises the keys to contentedness. Yet, what's so queer to me about this piece is that, personally, I find that I can relax much more looking at a piece of luxury rather than actually being on a vacation. Because no matter where you go, there you are. And no matter where you are, you cannot escape yourself. But this piece holds another promise as well. Because it says, you can be different. You will be better. You are preferred. You will thrive, and you will hold a soft stone, because you are here. Moving this way. Shuttling down. Here we have a different kind of key. This is Cubicle Key 2013, generously on loan from donor Asif Kamal. Thank you, Asif, whatever mm. you want. This key uh, has followed Asif around from cubicle to cubicle as he's moved around the office uh, for the last several years. We no longer know what it opens. In that way, it has taken on a sort of good luck charm for Asif. It's funny how objects such as these that we accumulate in our office spaces take on a nostalgic weight. To feel that weight physically, literally today, Michael will be donning it to experience the emotional weight of an object such as this. Now this key is interesting because it looks functional. It looks like it serves a purpose, unlocking something. But as I told you, we don't know what it unlocks. In that way, it's sort of masquerading as a functional object when really it is just a good luck charm. Mm. 
interesting how to the normal passersby they would not think anything of it. Because if you did just have an object, just to keep an object, it might be seen as deviant behavior, some evoking notions of lunacy and mm. hoarding. Mm. It's scary how in our society we are not allowed to appreciate the inefficiency of things. Now, of course, someday we might find the mate that this key unlocks, mm. or we might not. And that's okay, too. But of course, it's important to remember that charms attract other charms, like a magnet. Mm. And that's hard science, folks. Let's move one more time into the Tom B. Foundation wing. Let's take a look at Jewel Osco Paste Up 2017. Now, this is by far the second most political piece that we have in the gallery. And what's so striking about this is the nature in which it was found. It was found discarded, abandoned, on the westbound CTA 81 bus in an empty seat. Now, the piece is striking because of the systems in play. This piece is full of systems. Not only do we have the employee's name and address, social security number, employee ID, department ID, location, pay rate, pay group, pay begin date and end date, the business unit, the check number, the check date, the tax data, the tax status, the allowances, the description of federal withholding and Illinois withholding, the number of hours worked, the before tax deductions, the employer paid deductions, and the after tax deductions, the total gross, the federal taxable gross, the total taxes, the total deductions, and the net pay. Note, no benefits. What's finally so striking about this piece is the fact that despite all the systems, all we truly care about at the end of the day is the number at the bottom of the page. We're going to scoot right down the full of it. Here we have Fortune from a Cookie, 2012. Michael, will you uh, read for us what you see written here? Yes, uh, you will never know you're full. That's right, you will never know you're full. Now, what is the next logical word that your mind jumps to on that when you read that? Potential. Correct, potential. You will never know your full potential. Generally speaking, when you open a fortune cookie, you expect a positive message of affirmation. Here, this fortune falls into the negative binary, your brain inhabiting that negative force. Not only that, but it is incomplete, completely incomplete. Mm. It brings us into an existential state, begging the question, does God exist? We're now going to move finally to the last piece of today's tour, entitled, Keep Your Receipts. 2017. Now, the paper trail that you see before you is not showy or flashy in the traditional sense. In fact, you could argue that any single one of these receipts on its own does not warrant much attention, does not pull your focus. But lined up one after another, they march towards the future, signifying the goods and services that we have procured. And in that way, they also serve as a historical thumbprint to the past, signaling where we've been. But that being the case, they are almost immediately rendered archaic and outdated. In fact, so many of our consumer shopping experiences today are happening online that we're living in an increasingly paperless world. Yet it should be noted that even in real-time scenarios, shoppers will frequently decline receiving a receipt, even at the cash register, uh, evidently very confident they are not being swindled. The curators were able to amass such a large number of receipts over just a few short weeks. 
It astounded them how many they were able to get in such a short amount of time. But of course, time does make fools of us all. As we can see, the majority of these receipts are printed on thermal paper, which, as you may know, is a paper source tragically riddled with BPA. So, please do not touch. But, despite their danger, these pieces are also delicate. Uh, they are each time stamped and dated, specific to a specific moment. And, like that, they are unique like a snowflake. Yet also like a snowflake, their beauty isn't ostentatious. You have to look for it. These receipts are the art of the every day. To this quote Richard Move, what if art was simply paying attention? We so often slough off the things we accrue as they burden us, but what if we were to see them as a benefit a, and show gratitude for the small miracles in our everyday life? One only has to start by noticing. Perhaps notice the sound of the receipt. The crinkle of the paper. Or perhaps notice the sheen. Or the way the ink does or does not smudge. Perhaps notice the instances where the receipts are intact, flat and clean and then also other moments where they are crumpled and not quite so self-respecting. It's important to notice the small reminders of the human beings who are behind these commercial transactions. Iris M, Juan Pedro, Kaylee. There is a human behind the machine. Perhaps it's important to remember that we all, all of us humans, are able to make a mark on this world, however small. As you can see, the paper trail of the curators ends here. But on this wall, we see the contributions of gallery viewers, everyday folks, viewers like you. They have contributed to the receipt collection, adding their own instances of a paper trail. That concludes our tour of Intangible Notions on Top of Object. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Yes, thank you. Salute.